Now it's my delight to introduce Afua Bruce, who's going to lead this panel. She's a prominent public interest technologist working at the intersection of technology, policy, and society. With a career spanning government, private, nonprofit, and academic sectors, she has held senior positions at the White House, the FBI, and organizations like Data Kind, New America, IBM. Afua is the founder of A&B Advisory Group, which specializes in responsible data and technology consulting. Her expertise in software engineering, data science, and community engagement is combined with a focus on equity-based frameworks. And we'll save our applause for all of them, but Afua is going to sit all the way down here. I'll say it's in the Oprah chair. And then Michael Campbell, come on up, is general manager for EdTech Innovation Transformation at Intel. And uh, Rosanna Durthry, who is VP Global Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging for LinkedIn. And Charles Radman, who's our sponsor. We're celebrating our ninth year of Global Minded this year. Charlie has been with us and Hewlett Packard since 2015, and we're super grateful for that. And last but not least, Guillermo Diaz, he goes by G. He's the founder and CEO of Conectado. And Charles is our honorary, but the rest of these folks won the Inclusive Leader Awards last night. So let's give these folks a round of applause for making time for all of us to stay today. Good morning. All right, third time's the charm. Excellent. Good morning. Okay, good try. All right, uh, so I'm excited to uh, be moderating this panel uh, today on the future of inclusive work, tech, learning, and leading um, from chat GP to AR, VR, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, to gaming, anything to close the equity gap. And these are all of the current technology buzzwords it feels like just slammed into this title. So really excited to think about the implications of technology on society. Um, over the past few months, uh, we have had everything from OpenAI's release of ChatGPT, releases of ChatGPT, which really have people thinking about how to use AI broadly and generative AI specifically. Is it going to take over all of our jobs? Is it going to make schools obsolete? Is it the best thing ever that will mean we can somehow make money but still sit around all day? Um, what, what will become when we start to embrace generative AI? This week, uh, Apple also unveiled their latest um, and newest AR VR headset. It's their first new product since 2014, so clearly something that they've been thinking about for a while and are really betting that it's going to, it's going to change how we interact with the internet, how we interact with each other. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, the new uh, headset allows users to navigate apps and screens with their eyes and with their hands. Um, the screens are displayed in space. And it also allows you uh, to conduct your searches by voice. So very much changing how we interact from physical devices to just the world around us. The promise of new technologies is often great. Um, and as a computer engineer, I've definitely uh, am part of the technology can be so wonderful. But I think we have to really critically ask ourselves, um, is it great for everyone? And how is it great? Um, I co-wrote a book last year called The Tech That Comes Next that examined how technology can advance equity. And one of the key lessons we had in that book is that technology isn't a naturally occurring resource. We make intentional decisions about what technology to build and how to use different technologies in different aspects of our lives. AI, for example, because Carol uh, mentioned AI, I think just after she called us all famous, which was a pleasant surprise. Um, but AI, for example, can help organizations make better decisions and, um, and really increase their decision making. Um, I worked on a project a couple of years ago that used AI with a, a four-year college to help increase graduation rates significantly for uh, students who started their careers later in life. 
Um, but AI can also be misused. Um, Amazon, a couple of years ago, tried internally to develop an AI system to help identify who would be the best leaders and managers in the organization. And the algorithm said that white men from particular schools would be the best leaders, and that's um, not, of course, not the case, but is what sort of the data and the AI indicated. Um, an organization called CDT released a report last year that showed that some of the AI technologies used to administer uh, virtual testing, especially during the pandemic, but that continue to be used, uh, disproportionately inflict harm onto people with disabilities because they do things like track uh, finger movement, track uh, other physical movement, and if you have different tics or mannerisms um, because of a disability, the system would then flag you for uh, potentially cheating and exhibiting behavior um, that was atypical of people who were uh, rightfully taking their test. So lots of positives and negatives. <clears throat> Ultimately, I think it comes down to what we value is what we build, whether we're building technology or companies or educational institutions. And so with that, let's, let's get into it. Again, um, I'm glad to be joined today by Michael Campbell, who's the GM of EdTech Innovation and Transformation at Intel, Rosanna Dorothy, who's the VP of Global Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at LinkedIn, Charlie Radman, who's the head of uh, the Worldwide Education at HP, and Guillermo Diaz, the founder and CEO of Connectado, Inc. One of the things I really think about is that it takes a lot of different smart people to make smart decisions about technology, of which you all represent. So we'll just um, go down the line here, maybe starting the first question with you, Michael. And I wonder if you can tell us what... Um Testing tech, real time, you're welcome. Uh, so Michael, if you... Switch this um, as another microphone hopefully magically appears, or we'll just pass this one.
I don't think any of us expected to be listening to music off of our phones. Um, but it's, it's a really good example of its application and its usefulness. And I think, um, as Michael indicated, it doesn't supplant our intelligence, it should enhance and augment our intelligence. Um, to speak to some of the threats or the downsides, you know, I've been playing with uh, generative AI and chat GPT. Um, we do it at home. So I have a 12 year old who's doing this as well. The idea is how to learn to ask the right questions so that you're getting information that's reliable. But if you don't and you trust the information blindly without verifying, you might find some pitfalls. I tested it on my bio and it kept assigning employers I've never had. Um, Last week there was a case, an attorney lost a case because he used ChatGPT to generate his final arguments, to create citations and reference cases. It turned out that none of the cases or citations referenced in the final documentation through ChatGPT ever even existed. And so we can't be lazy. And if there's, if there's anything I would advise is we always have to do our due diligence. We always have to be prepared. We can't blindly accept the answer any more than the idea of Googling our way through life means we've got the right answers. And we have to be, I think, concerned with preparedness, ensuring that we all have the skill and that we're all providing the inputs for these large learning models. They re rely upon data which means they're capturing the data. And depending upon who's actually building the models and who has that capability and skill set, it's going to be biased on the perceptions that individual or set or team of individuals may hold, which makes it more urgent for all of us to participate and to have the skills and build the capabilities to contribute to the thinking that designs the, those data sets, to contribute to the questioning, God bless you, of those data sets, and ensures that we're all represented in much the same way our current world exists, where representation has shown us that when we don't have voices in the room, perspectives that represent our, our experiences, decisions get made, products get designed, and they can have really consequential impacts for communities like ours. So I think it's a really good thing, and we have to be really responsible for that really good thing. So I want to pick up the topic that she just mentioned um, in regard to buy use the tools. So from a point of view, I can tell you that the, um, um, I can tell you that uh, you cannot code out bias. So when you actually go into the code, you cannot remove bias from the actual bias. You may need a new microphone. <laughs> Going while they, they get a, a new microphone here, but you can't code out bias. The only way that you can actually get rid of bias is through use of the tool. That means everyone needs to have use of the tool. That needs, means we need to make sure that those who do not have access today get access. Those who do not have the connectivity, those who do not have the knowledge of how to use it need to know how to use it. We need to make sure that they get access to the tool so that it can learn how to work with them. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to build and perpetuate those who are actually having access today. So that's one of the big concerns that I have right now with AI. The second thing I have as a concern with AI, and then I'll talk about all the positives because there's a lot of positives as well. But the second thing I have a concern with AI is something that I learned from the president of Western Governors University. He raised this point at ASU GSV a few weeks back, which is that up through right now in our time, Humankind had to solve a problem. Everything that we were trying to do in life was problem solving, critical thinking. We came up with a lot of great stuff by accident because we were trying to solve some problem, right? But now we're gonna change that mentality and we're not gonna be problem solvers anymore. We're gonna be inquisitors. We're gonna inquire and ask questions to the device and the device is gonna solve the problem. What does that do to humankind? That's an ethical question I think we need to grapple with a little bit, which is, do we change? Does humankind change? Because now we're no longer solving a problem, but now we're asking questions. And do you ask the right question? 
Do you format the question in the right way? So I think that's a concern that we just need to think about as we start to work with these tools. The last thing I would say then on a positive side is the ability to personalize education. So one of the things I'm extremely excited about, and I don't know if you guys have played with this yet or not, if you haven't, I really agree or think you should go out and play with it, which is, I may need that mic. Okay, we're going to keep uh, trying this. Um, so the, the one positive that was on personalization, I don't know if you've tried Khan Migo yet from uh, Khan Academy. Sal Khan and the Khan team have put together this amazing tool. And what it is is a personalized tutor that will learn how you learn. And it will work with you as a tutor would work with you. So instead of ChatGPT, where you go to ChatGPT and say, I want a report that does this, and it's in this format, and this many words, and it just spits out the report, and you don't know if it's accurate or not, by the way, Con Migo will actually walk you through writing the report together. It will help pitch an idea. It will write the first sentence. It'll ask you to write the next three sentences. It will then review that and then say, well, that's a really good idea. What if we continue to explore this? And it works together with you as a tutor would work with you. And it learns you. So from a personalized instruction, personalized learning, which is the thing that we've always tried to go to, that's going to be amazing. From a teacher's perspective, it will actually help them write lessons and curriculum, come up with a rubric, and then come up with the assessment to go along with that rubric in about 15 minutes instead of four hours that teachers are having to spend every single night creating those lessons. So I think that's the positive side from an education point of view. And again, you can sign up right now to go out and try the beta version of Conmigo. So if you haven't done that, get out your phones, after the session, mind you, but get out your phones and go out and sign up. Use it. It's an amazing tool, and I think that that is one of the great things about what AI can actually bring to us. So I need to sit up over here because this is, uh, I'm gonna come at it from a little bit different angle. Um, and why I stepped out of my corporate role after, you know, almost 30 years in, in corporation and building big systems is um, I saw a need um, coming from a Latino background, and I saw a need, uh, and I happened to live in the state of California. And in the state of California is the fourth largest economy in the world. So you have the US, China, India, California. Okay, so, and in that state, the majority today of the state happens to be Latino. And in that state, 56% of the K through 12 students happen to be Latino. And 53% of the graduates that are happening today, or in this, the next couple of weeks, happen to be Latino. And I'm not saying that because I'm Latino, I'm saying that because that's fact. So I stepped out because there was this, I saw this intersection of data, AI, of experiential technologies, AR, VR, and a foundational architecture technology that was ledgering all this called blockchain. And those I saw as, these are three technologies that regardless of what I think, it's gonna happen. It's going to happen by us, with us, or to us. And so I said, I wanna have, I wanna have, have it happen by us and with us. And yes, it's gonna to happen to us, but, but hopefully we'll, we'll be in front of that. And so AI, you know, if you think about, like, you, like we were hearing, you know, I, I was thinking about the other day, it was like, where's that, where's that paper map that I used to use way back in the day when we used to go on trips? You don't use that anymore. And it's like, now I'm, now I'm just either watching the screen or I'm listening, take a right here, take a left there. It, it's, it's happening. So AI to the, the points that we're, that we're hearing is going to happen. And... I was just looking at a report uh, two weeks ago. If you are a, a, an, 
an AI prompter, you can make $400,000 a year starting salary. And for the students in this room, I mean, who wants to make $400,000 starting salary? <laughs> and it's like, I think when I started, mine was making $22,000 a year. Um, but 400000 and and that's happening. So I stepped out of this role to create that, to help this demographic navigate from the classroom to career to ultimately to the boardroom. Because in that, in that same state that I mentioned, even though 56% of the K through 12 students happen to be Latino, there's only 4% representation in tech. Four. And that's been the same thing for the last decade. So uh, my point is how we use this technology, how we get in front of it to be able to program the robot, not to be displaced by the robot. And so that's what I, that's, I wanted to come at it from that angle. Yeah, you know, what you're saying, G, I think is really important. There's a real headline here for all of you in this room. And the headline is, we're at the start of something new. You can be at the front of something new. All too frequently, what we've seen in the course of careers is that we've followed the existing path. And often when we follow the path into a role, we follow the path into roles that become the roles that, you know, when te new technology comes in, those roles go away. You can be the creators and you can be engaged with what it's like to train these large models, with what it's like to learn how to create the right prompts for AI. Because the reality is, your starting now is going to put you ahead of the work that a lot of people in business are doing today, because they don't know how to do this either. And I think when we imagine that our careers aren't linear, but they kind of wiggle and zigzag, and they'll skip a generation, it's a lot like the idea that when I was your age, coming out of school, excuse me, I used to use a telephone that had a very long cord. And if I wanted privacy, I would go into a closet <laughs> close the door and talk on that phone, and there would be this 10-foot cord that let everyone know exactly where I was and exactly what I was doing. There was no mobile phone that I carried around that allowed me to text. In countries that didn't even have landlines, when mobile technology was introduced, they didn't start with landlines and then go to mobile technology. They just went straight to mobile technology. I think we're in that same moment here. The context for generative AI, the context for AR and VR does not require previous experience. It requires curiosity. It requires the ability to learn. And where the future is going to be a little different from the past, your education is really important, but it's the skills your education is giving you that will create value. Your ability to speak to those skills will open up the door for the opportunities that exist. At LinkedIn, we see that one in five jobs now no longer requires education. And what that basically means is, you may not have the degree, but if you have the skills to go with the experience, you can be competitive for that role, that role can be yours. What that means is that today, if on your own you decided that you wanted to take you know, courses in Python and learn to be a Python programmer, you don't actually have to have you know, a college degree in computer science to get a job in Python. My son is 12 and he's been doing Python for five years now. So the market is going to change and you are at the front stage of that change because you can learn quickly and you don't have to unlearn all the stuff that we have to unlearn because we've, we've filled our heads with a lot of information and some of it isn't going to be so helpful going forward. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for um, all of your responses. I think touching on um, 
the, uh, the negatives. I thought we were gonna start with the positives, but touching on some of the, the challenges and risks as we think about adopting AI um, and AR, VR and other technologies is really important. And then um, as Guillermo and Rosanna, you touched on, there's a lot of opportunity now for different um, skills to be developed, different ways of thinking about interacting with technology, creating new businesses. Um, I just wanna do a quick poll of the room. How many folks in here um, are majoring or studying in a technical field? Computer science, computer engineering, other computer folks? It's just me. <laughs> okay, um, how many uh, people in the room have played around with chat GPT or another open AI, um, generative AI tool? Excellent. Um, how many of you know um, other, let's say parents, or um, other folks of the, the generation older than you who've also played around with generative AI. Okay, so we're already seeing some confirmation of what's, what's been talked about here. I think just picking up on some of uh, what's been mentioned, um, you know, from the technical perspective, there is very much an opportunity now, especially if you have a technical background, to be part of building models differently. We've seen how um, OpenAI has implemented generative AI, but there are a lot of open source um, tools that are coming out that do center more community-centered values and more values from um, historically marginalized communities. So looking at what data ownership means, looking at what it means to attribute um, the initial creator of the data that's being used in the generative AI systems. We can think about how to structure data to make sure, um, you know, literally people of color, black and brown and other races are actually seen in the data and how that's reflected in the data. Then from the business perspective, we can think about um, how we make use of these decisions. I think Levi's announced a couple um, of months ago, I think they walked this back, I'm not sure, I hope they've walked it back, that with the use of generative AI, they can now have models of all different races. Not because they're hiring models, but because they'll use generative AI to create it. So even if you don't have a technical background, you can see how understanding this technology can really help you affect business leadership and business decisions. So my next question to the panel, since we've been talking a little bit about how students can be involved, how students should think about, is what advice, what is your advice to students who want to change the world as tech stars or change makers based on um, your path and personal values? Well, I, I, I would just start and say that if you're not pursuing a technical path, being either STEM or STEAM or engineering, that is okay. Okay? I am a product of a liberal arts education. Okay? And I'm working for the most technical company, perhaps, on the planet. It can be done. I have not taken engineering classes, but I truly believe that if that is not your passion, then pursue a liberal arts education. And here's why. Machines will not replace empathy. Machines will not replace compassion. Machines will not replace critical thinking skills, analytical th skills, how to connect and communicate with people. You can learn this, you can develop those skills, nurture those skills. I'm still developing those skills and I'm in, I'm, I'm in my late 40s. This is a life in progress, right? a journey in progress, and me being here certainly helps nurture that. So I just want to encourage you to think about that. If technical path is not your path, that is okay. Pursue a liberal arts education. And then also I would say, you know, think about, based on our conversation today, based on the advice, what is it that you're going to do? What is your call to action for you? And that is a customized, you know, mandate that only you can answer. Just think about that for a little bit. Cool, excellent call out. I think what's really important to consider is you evolve your career. You know, like Michael, I'm liberal arts. I didn't take any technology as I was going to school, but I've, I've learned and applied it in the course of my life. I'm not an engineer, but being fluent, much like being fluent with another language, 
it's helpful to be able to be fluent with technology and fluent in an analog state. And that analog state is about relationships. Relationships matter. Working at LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network, there are more than 950 million members on the platform. But we've been working really hard because we see that there is a network gap that exists among our black members, among women, among our Latino members, in that their networks are smaller. It doesn't mean you know less people, but as you grow in your career, what's really going to be fundamental is that you not only have the skills to do your job, but that you're connected to the people who can help open the doors to opportunity for you as well. Yes, we can apply for jobs, but what we've also seen is if you know someone who works in a company where you're applying for a job, your chances of getting an interview and getting hired are always going to be greater because you have someone advocating for you. So the relational qualities that make us human, that enable us to connect to each other, that enable us to respond to each other, is not something technology could ever provide. And much as Carol invited you to today, think about not just the objectives you have in life, but the relationships you're building in your life. Two days ago, I spoke to my first boss to wish her a happy birthday. What you should know is that she was my first boss 43 years ago. It's been a really long time. But as life goes on, we have greater capacity now through technology to stay connected to the people who have meant something to us. And it doesn't mean you have to call them all the time. If you develop a strong relationship, once a year you just pick up where you left off. And if you don't have a relationship, to be intentional in how you get to know someone and let them get to know you. Because in your career journey, determinations will be made about you often based on what people don't know about you, based on what they will suppose or imagine, which is why being your authentic self, being able to create relationships where it's understood not only the things you're great at, but what motivates you, what drives you, who you are as an individual, is something that can't be mimicked by technology at this time. So I'm gonna confess something in a room with a live stream. No, don't do it. <laughs> I don't have a degree. I'm head of worldwide education for HP, and I don't have a degree. But I'm a lifelong learner. So I started at HP in the call center, tech support. Hello, can I help you solve your problem? Or as the comedy says, have you unplugged it and plugged it back in? <laughs> That's the equivalent of starting in the mail room in technology. And I worked my way up. I took different jobs. When somebody says, does somebody want to volunteer and take on this project? My hand went up. Does somebody want to learn how to do XYZ skill? My hand went up. Does somebody want to work 80 hours a week? My hand went up. It's what it took, but I worked my way up. I continued to take classes. In fact, I still take classes to this day. I'm on Coursera a lot. I'm taking entrepreneur classes because I want to know. I want to learn. I'm taking an AI class right now because I want to know what's coming, right? LinkedIn, a lot of great courses. Shout out to LinkedIn. So what I would say as, um, you know, an advice, the first thing I would say is become that lifelong learner. Your learning does not stop when you get your certification, when you get your degree, when you get that piece of paper in your hand or that digital certificate that follows you around. Continue to learn and grow and improve your skills. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say really quick is embrace culture. So one of the amazing things about being at HP, people always ask, why did you stay for HP, at HP for 23 years? I've been there almost 24 years now. It's the culture. Yeah, it's a good pay, it's a great job, but it's the people I get to work with every single day. It's the values of the company that I embrace. But the values of the company are really the values of the people that work there. 
Bring your values wherever you go. Embrace the culture that you enter in, but also change that culture with your own values. Continue to lift up those around you who need lifted up. Continue to spotlight those who are amazing. Because you spotlight them does not make you any less. It's not a competition, regardless of what we were all led to believe. Life is not a competition. School is a competition for some reason, shouldn't be. But life is not a competition. So lift up those people around you, embrace that culture, and then make that culture your own values. Um, wow. <laughs> um, so I'm going to add, I agree with everything here, and I'm going to add a little bit of my own hot sauce. So here's my hot sauce, is even if you're getting a degree in accounting, even if you're getting a degree in business, my belief is every job will have some sort of tech component to it, a digital component. And every relationship, just think about what, what was said here, is my relation, I'm a relationship guy, so that's how I built my, my career, is, is interacting and being able to connect with people. But the use of, I'm a, and also a network guy, because I come from Cisco. So because of that network, I can exponentially create that, the, those relationships. So those relationships, like I, I have relationships with, and I find, you know, my boss from 30 years ago, it's like, holy smokes, they showed up on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, and they reached out. It's like, I, how would I have done that otherwise? So those, those also help me maintain those connections and almost inventory or keep a database of those. But I want to give you a real example. Um, so in Conectado, which is... A, a, an AR, VR, metaverse platform to enable someone to get from the classroom to their career, to the growth, ultimately to the boardroom. And I thought, well, you know, let's go create this cool platform. You know, we'll use AI, we'll use AR, VR. But if you remember the problems I mentioned earlier about the percentages, it's like, but why is it that this student isn't getting from here to there. Why aren't they getting those jobs? It's not, it's not necessarily the technology problem. There's an underlying cultural, social, emotional, and technology problem. So my first hire, employee number one, because I come from the tech world, was Dr. Diana Pacheco. She's a doctor of education. No tech background, but she understands and understood the reasons and the underlying th issues of why a student doesn't get from here to there. Why is it that there is, there, is, it, is it cultural? Is it emotional? Is it social? And bringing those two worlds together. And to our, my friend here, Michael, is bringing education and technology together is that's, you know, the, that was the, you know, kind of the um, epiphany that I, that I saw was it's not just about the tech. It's about all this other intelligence. And, and our second hire was this, this kid named Michael Diaz. And Michael Diaz's degree is in social sciences because we're studying the impact on people. So social science, he's like, I never really thought that I could be in a tech or tech kind of job, but my job is data about people. And my job is helping people. And how do I accelerate that by the use of AI and the use of data and the use of bringing these worlds together? And so my, you know, a lot of the hiring that I'm doing is not just about, you know, let's go get an engineer that knows how to program. They're like, what, what is that? that person that knows how to understand the issues around those social, cultural, and emotional issues, right? 
So there are a couple of points I want to underscore from what the panel has said. I think the first one is that there are different types of expertise and all different types of expertise matter. Whether your expertise is uh, technical expertise, whether it's in the humanities, whether it is um, your own lived experience that you bring, different expertise matters and it all needs to be at the table. Um, one of the things that we wrote about in the tech that comes next is that Decisions about technology use should be made by everyone who is affected by technology, which to Guillermo's point, is everyone. We all use it all the time. And so you have a right to be at that table. You should feel confident in inserting yourselves into those decision-making tables. And if you are in charge of those decision-making tables, make sure that you invite others with different types of expertise to those tables. So I want to just make sure we underscore that. And then for those of you who are students, know that there is an increasing amount of um, research being done in this area and actual formal educational programs being done in this area. So if you look up um, STS programs, if you look up public interest tech programs, these are programs at universities that are specifically designed to intentionally bring together the humanities with technical experts, with law students and with business students and put you all in classes together. Um, I think of uh, uh, Howard University has a great program that really intentionally combines social justice and data science. Boston University has another really wonderful program that really looks at how do we bring together um, the humanities, how do we insert them together to familiarize people with the language of technology, and then how do we make sure the technologists actually understand how to use some of this other expertise to understand how the world is working well, and how do they together make sure that technology is in service of humans, because ultimately that's what it's about, right? We're all humans here. The technology should serve us as opposed to humans serving technology, and we can't, have to remember we can't remove humans from any type of feedback loop or any type of technical loop um, that exists. The next question I want to pose to each of the panelists is, as a, as a leader, what do you believe needs to happen to use tech to close the equity gap? So getting back to the official title of this panel as we've meandered around some other topics, really thinking about these um, emerging technologies, how do we use them to help close the equity gap? Michael, we'll start with you. Well, the example that Charlie just talked about, I'm going to underscore. Uh, this was, so as Charlie talked about, Cellcon has this concept called Conmigo. Please go watch the TED Talk by Cell. It is amazing. And we've been talking about adaptive learning, personalized learning for years. But for the very first time, I think that we are at a turning point. So the idea that every student can have a virtual tutor that is built for them based on how they learn is a powerful moment where we can actually democratize education. Now, this is gonna take some time to develop so that it's, it's, it's thoughtful, it's fair, it's unbiased, but the concept for the first time ever is likely to come to fruition. I think Cellcon has an idea here. And I think that this concept, if it's done right, can help address uh, equity. Now, the concern I have though is, are we making sure that every student has access to this type of technology? And that's why companies like Intel and HP and other major players have to work with industry and also with public partnerships to ensure that every student has inclusive access. This is not a this is not going to happen overnight. This is going to be a, you know, a long game. So I'm very bullish on this virtual tutor as a tool to help drive uh, fair education for every student. And I think Cellcon is onto something. So what I'd add to that is companies, there are two, two particular things that I think companies need to do. One is to continue investing in diverse talent. Because if we don't have these voices and perspectives, in the design process, if we don't have these voices and perspectives, thinking about how these products influence and impact our lives, then we're invisible. It's in user experience, user design. It's critical that we have an understanding of communities that are going to be using the products. 
It's also important in the investing in talent that we're retaining that talent in industry. A lot of companies spend a lot of money on recruiting, but if your experience when you arrive in that company is one that isn't welcoming, where you don't feel you have a community, it's not likely you'll stay. You know, we did a study of, of Latino professionals, and what Latino professionals are telling us is that 37% are ready to leave the companies they're at right now. And 31% say the reason why they're leaving is because they don't see Latino leaders like themselves at the top. So if organizations aren't investing in the talent they have and creating an environment that's not only connected, where there's a sense of community and a sense of belonging, a sense that you can see yourself leading in that organization, it's unlikely that you'll stay in the organization. And then the second thing is continue to focus on mitigating bias. You know, very much as we heard from Charlie here, if bias is already in the system, you can't erase that. And so equity-centered design becomes a very necessary modality for how we are creating products and processes and systems so that everyone has access to the opportunities that are being created. And that's a big challenge. That's where the work of diversity, inclusion, and, and belonging and equity becomes so critical for companies today. It's not something they can just walk away from. Um, they can't talk about being fatigued about this. Because the reality is, and I tell my 12-year-old son this, he wakes up in the morning, he doesn't really want to brush his teeth. He still has to brush his teeth every day. He doesn't want to go to school. He still has to go to school every day. And so we as leaders can't hide behind this idea that it's not moving quickly enough. Maybe we've done all we can. No, we haven't. And then I'll leave the following. Companies need to continue imagining that innovation does not come from sameness. When you put the same people with the same ideas in the same room, you get the same outcomes. Same plus same equals same. The only way we can create what's next, the only way we can envision new possibility is to really change the dynamic, and that includes who's represented in the room, whose experiences are reflected in the conversation, whose ideas are introduced, so that we continue to get better at building systems and processes and products that are inclusive of all people. So I have to follow up on that just for a second because I think that's an incredible point. So HP is 88 years old. Silicon Valley, as we know it today, started with HP in our garage. Silicon Valley did not exist before HP. If we want to last for 88 more years, we need a different pipeline of talent coming into our company. Stanford University was our first pipeline of actually coming in to HP, engineers from Stanford. Our headquarters actually sits on Stanford property that we rented for 100 years. That rent's coming up, by the way, pretty soon. <laughs> but if we want to stick around, we need a different set of voices in our company. We need a more diverse set of voices in our company. We've recently changed to where we are actually focusing on bringing interns in from HBCUs and only from HBCUs. We focused on now bringing in interns from HSIs and only HSIs. We want to expand that, but everybody needs to be part of that conversation. As far as equity and technology is concerned, access certainly is important, as Michael referenced. A device for that access is certainly important. That's important to Michael and I as well, transparent. But you know what else is important? Digital literacy. Do you know how to actually use the device? Because simply being given a device and simply having that access does not mean you're actually getting anything out of it. So focusing on digital literacy is going to be very important. And for you, if you're struggling with your own digital literacy, seek out help. Seek out assistance. Don't struggle. Get the most out of it. It's a tool. And if you use it as a tool, the proper, proper way, the appropriate way, you're going to get the most out of it. And if you see others around you who are struggling, help them with that as well. Think about the older generation. Now, not our generation. Think about our parents. I spent a lot of time on my phone with my parents explaining to them how to get to Facebook 
over and over and over again, right? Digital literacy, help them with this, right? I think that's gonna be also important to close the equity gap. So um, I think the word that I would use is be intentional. As an employer, be intentional about your hiring. Don't just use the words D, E, I, B, F, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's like be intentional. I was just, you know, I was talked to uh, an employer about uh, their metrics. And he said, you know, we have all this pipeline coming in from the university. And it's like, yeah, but your number's still 4%. 4% Latino and 3% black, and it's been that way for a decade. It's like, so you're bringing them in, but, but a year and a half to two years later, they're gone. So why are they gone? What is the reason? Are you, are you just recruiting or are you retaining? So be intentional, right? So how do you retain? But on the flip side is, as a student, being the younger generation, be about where you want to go. Because you could have the career, you could have the skills, right? Let's call it the competence. But if you don't walk in with the confidence, you don't walk in with the connections, connect the ability to communicate and still maintain your culture as you go in because that culture is your identity and you want to be in a place where you can stay for a long period of time. That culture interaction and that integration is really important. I call them the C's, right? Maintain your culture. Make sure you have the confidence. Have the connections. Be able to communicate and the competence. So those are the things I would say as a, you know, first generation is up and coming. Be intentional about what you want to what you want to be. I think it's really great that the technology is um, coinciding with the agenda, that the microphone is starting to go out just as our time is running out. And I think the lesson um, and message that I hope that you all take from this panel, um, in addition to what has already been said, is that you are empowered to make a difference um, with uh, the world broadly, but with how we close the equity gap and how technology looks, how you know, the which we see bias in technology systems is does not have to be that way. There are a lot of people who are designing technology systems differently and more inclusively. You can be part of that process. The ways that um, technology is uh, available to people and who has access to it. We can write different policies, we can do different things. You can be a part of that. You can create those different policies. You can imagine um, and work on projects that bring in the humanities, that bring in the social responsibility to technology, to business. That is something that you all have the ability to do. And I hope that you understand that you are empowered to do that, whether you're a student, whether you're in a corporation, or whether you're in the nonprofit sector, be empowered with that.